In this section, we're going to learn about TypeScript. TypeScript is a programming language primarily used with Angular. It's completely optional to use TypeScript. However, I highly recommend learning it. A majority of projects, tutorials, and examples are written with TypeScript. It's hard to escape. So, if you want to learn Angular, learning TypeScript is a must. If you already know TypeScript, feel free to skip this section of the course. I'm not going to be teaching anything groundbreaking. As long as you know the basics, you should be good to go. Otherwise, let's learn TypeScript together. So, what is TypeScript? TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript. It is a language built on top of the JavaScript language. If you know JavaScript, you know TypeScript. Features such as variables, conditional statements, and functions are written the same way in TypeScript. We don't need to learn an entirely new set of syntax rules for getting started. In fact, we can rename our files to TypeScript without modifying the original source code. Our JavaScript code would still work. Instead, TypeScript adds features to improve the developer experience. Notice how I said developer experience. TypeScript doesn't add features for enhancing the performance or security of an app. Instead, it's a language designed to help developers debug and design their applications. It accomplishes this goal by introducing static typing to the language. As we know, data types are categories for our data. We have strings, numbers, booleans, and objects. These are just some examples of data types. For the most part, we never have to worry about the data type of our variables. JavaScript is a dynamically typed language. We have the opportunity to change the data type of our variables at any point in our application. Here's an example. We have a variable called price. The data type starts as a number. On line 2, the variable is updated to a string. Behind the scenes, the environment will change the data type on our behalf. It won't complain if we attempt to do something like this. This feature is convenient. It's one of the reasons why JavaScript is beginner-friendly. While suitable, there are some pitfalls beginners can fall into. In a large application, data is constantly flowing through different files, objects, and functions. Let's say we're developing a checkout system. The user will want the grand total for their purchase. However, before we present them with the total, we may want to run their purchase price through several functions. For example, what if they're using a coupon? We should apply the coupon to the price first. Not so fast. We need to calculate taxes. Don't forget to add the cost of shipping. During this entire process, the price will be passed around through a couple of functions. It's possible that the data type may change during this process. If it does, we may get unexpected behavior. Our functions assume the price will be a number. What if it changes to a string? JavaScript won't throw an error. It'll allow the data type to change even when we don't want it to. We'll only find out if the data type changes by testing the app in the browser. Wouldn't it be convenient to catch this type of error in our code while writing it? That's possible with TypeScript. We'll get into TypeScript in a moment, but let's see how this error can happen in our script. I've prepared a little example. It's a single file called example.js. In this example, I have a function called addShipping. It has two arguments called price and shipping. The price argument refers to the price of the product. The shipping argument refers to the cost of shipping. Inside the function, we're logging the two arguments after they've been added together. The function should log a number. Below the function definition, we're calling this function with the numbers 10 and 5. Let's try running this script. In the command line, I'll run the script with the following command. As expected, we got 15. Perfect, right? What if we pass in a string instead of a number? Back in our file, I'll wrap the first number with some quotes. Next, I'll rerun the script. This time, we got 105. If I were a customer, I'd be turned off by this calculation. This type of error occurred because of how we've written our code. We passed in a string when we meant to pass in a number. TypeScript is designed to catch errors like these. It's a language that can check the data types of our variables. 
It's much stricter than JavaScript, but worth it in the end. We can improve the developer experience by switching to TypeScript. Let's dive into TypeScript in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to install a compiler for TypeScript. That sounds strange, doesn't it? Normally, we would be able to write JavaScript right away. We wouldn't need to worry about compiling the code ourselves since the browser will interpret our code for us. However, it's a different story with TypeScript. Most browsers don't support TypeScript. Therefore, we need to compile our TypeScript code into JavaScript. After we've compiled it to JavaScript, we'll be able to run our code in the browser or node. Luckily, this process is painless. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to TypeScript. Everything you'd like to learn about TypeScript can be found here. On this page, it'll recommend some installation methods. TypeScript can be installed with NPM. Let's give it a try. Copy the command from the documentation. Inside the command line, I will paste and run the command. If you're on a Mac or Linux, you may need to add the sudo command before running it. It'll give you proper permissions for installing packages. Otherwise, running the command as is will work fine. For this installation, I'm working in the same directory we were in in the last lecture. This installation should take a few seconds. We're installing TypeScript locally. We have the option of installing it globally, but that won't be necessary. It's enough to have it installed locally. After installing TypeScript, we can begin to write TypeScript code. The first step for writing TypeScript is to create a file. In our project, we're going to rename the example.js file by changing the extension to ts. ts is short for TypeScript. After changing the file type, we've written our first TypeScript file. As I've said before, TypeScript syntax is the exact same as JavaScript syntax. Every syntax feature from JavaScript is supported in TypeScript. Therefore, we don't need to learn an entirely new set of syntax rules. After we've written our TypeScript code, the next step is to compile it into JavaScript. We can use the compiler we installed to help us with that step. In the command line, we can run TypeScript by adding the npx csc command. npx is a command created by npm. In the Node.js ecosystem, some packages add commands to the command line. The npx command allows us to run those commands that come from those packages. For example, tsc is a command defined by the TypeScript package. npm will take care of searching for the command in the TypeScript package. After typing the command, we need to provide the file's name we want to compile from TypeScript to JavaScript. Let's pass in example.ts. Afterward, we'll run the command. After a few moments, the command will finish running. So, what happened? If we look in our project directory, we'll find a new file has been generated called example.js. Let's take a look inside. We have the exact same code we had before. The problem we had before persisted. At this point, it doesn't feel like TypeScript isn't helping us. In the next couple of lectures, we're going to explore the syntax added by TypeScript. By doing so, we'll be able to fix our issue. I'll see you there. In this lecture, we're going to explore a concept called type annotations. They're a new syntax feature available in TypeScript. To fix our problem, our function's argument should be constrained to numbers. If we attempt to pass in a string or boolean, an error should be thrown. We can implement this behavior with type annotations. Type annotations are a way to describe the data in our application. We can annotate almost anything in our code. We can annotate variables, functions, arrays, and objects. Let's start with functions. In the add shipping function, we're going to annotate the function's parameters. We can annotate a parameter by adding a colon after the parameter name followed by the data type. For the price parameter, we're going to set the data type to number. We'll use the same type for the shipping parameter. 
By adding these annotations, TypeScript will restrict the type of values we can pass onto this function. Notice how I'm using the lowercase version of the word. It's important that we type number with lowercase n instead of an uppercase n. Otherwise, we may confuse the application with the data type. Let's see what happens when we attempt to compile our code. In the command line, run the npxtsc example.ts command. An error has been produced. The error is telling us we have a problem on line 5. It's saying we're passing in a string when it's expecting a number. By adding annotations, we're able to catch errors like these. We can think of type annotations as a way to document our code. The compiler will read our documented code and determine if we're doing something out of the ordinary. Let's fix this issue. In the file, I'm going to remove the quotes from the first argument. After doing so, I'll compile the code again. This time, our code gets compiled without a problem. Let's check out the JavaScript file. The annotations we've added are gone. TypeScript will remove its features so that our code can run in the browser. The purpose of using TypeScript is to help us debug our application before running it in an environment. If the compiler can successfully compile our code, we should be safe from type errors. Imagine if we were building a checkout system. A checkout system involves a series of steps. We wouldn't be able to catch this error until after the user has provided their shipping information. With TypeScript, we're able to catch the bug before opening the browser. That's the beauty of TypeScript. Let's take our example a step further. We can annotate the return values of a function. At the moment, in the TypeScript file, we're logging a message in our function. Let's change this line to return the value. It would be nice if we could tell the compiler will always return a number after the function's parentheses, but before the curly braces, we'll add a colon followed by the data type. In this example, we'll set the data type to number. The syntax for type annotation is the same syntax for adding type annotation to parameters. It's a colon followed by the name of the data type. This piece of code will tell TypeScript the function is only allowed to return numbers. Let's see what happens if we attempt to return a value with a different type. Inside the function, we will return a random string. Next, in the command line, we'll try to compile the file. We get an error. It's telling us we're attempting to return a string instead of a number. Our editors also highlight this error. If you're using Visual Studio Code like me, there will be a red squiggly line below the return statement. We can hover our mouse over this to read the same message. Let's fix this problem by reverting our changes to the original solution. Next, we'll compile the script. The compiler successfully compiled our code. Let's check out the JavaScript file. Once again, the annotation has been removed from our code. It's a step performed by TypeScript. That about wraps it up. In the next lecture, we'll continue exploring TypeScript. In this lecture, we're going to look at how to annotate variables. For this demonstration, let's work inside a new file. I'll create a file called variables.ts. Inside this file, we will create a variable called myName. We'll set this variable to a string. Variables can be annotated with the same syntax we used for annotating function arguments and return values. After the variable name, we will add a colon followed by the data type. Since we're storing a name, it makes sense to set the data type to string. It's as simple as that. You may be wondering, what types can we use in type annotation? Every primitive type is supported in TypeScript. I'll add a comment above to list them. The following types are supported. String, Number, Boolean, Null, and Undefined. By annotating variables, we can't reassign the variable to a different type. 
if we ever reassign the variable, the value must be of the same type. For example, if we were to update the myName variable to a number, we would encounter an error. If we hover our mouse over the reassignment, we will get an error telling us we can't use a number. This is because we're restricted to strings. If we were to change the value to another string, the error goes away. One of the cool things about TypeScript is type inference. Admittedly, adding type annotations can make our code seem cluttered. They're incredibly helpful, but we should take every opportunity to make our code simple and clean. TypeScript is intelligent to detect the data types of our variables. This feature is called type inference. Let's remove the type annotation from the variable. Even though we've removed the annotation, TypeScript will set the variable's data type to a string. If we hover our mouse over the variable name, the editor will tell us the type is set to string. How is this possible? It's because of our value. If a variable is initialized with a value, TypeScript will infer the type based on the value. In this example, we're setting the myName variable to a string. Therefore, TypeScript will infer the variable is a string. Below, if we were to set the variable to a number, we would get the same error as before. This feature is incredibly convenient. We should always take advantage of this feature whenever we can. It's redundant to set the type if TypeScript is capable of inferring the type for us. For the rest of this course, if TypeScript can infer the type, we will let it set the type. There are some limitations. Firstly, it only works if the variable is initialized with a value. If we were to omit the value, TypeScript would not infer the data type. For example, if we remove the value and then hover our mouse over the name, the type is set to any. The any type is given to a variable when TypeScript isn't sure what data type to use. It allows for a variable to store any type of value. We can store numbers, strings, objects, etc. If we were to switch between different data types, TypeScript wouldn't throw an error. To be clear, this data type is exclusive to TypeScript. In some cases, you may want this behavior. However, most of the time, we want to be strict with our data types. I'll revert this variable to its original value. The second limitation we should be aware of is that this feature is not available to function parameters. Let's switch over to the example.ts file for a moment. Next, we will remove the type annotations from the parameters. After removing them, TypeScript will annotate both parameters with the any type. Even though we're passing in numbers, TypeScript still doesn't know what data type the parameters should be. I'll add the annotations back to the function. That's about it for variables. We'll continue in the next one. In this lecture, we're going to learn about a feature called union types. They give us more flexibility with annotating data. We've seen how TypeScript can restrict the type of a variable either by explicitly setting the type or letting JavaScript infer the type. Up until now, we've been stuck with a single type. What if we want to allow multiple types? For example, we may want to retrieve the name from an API. The initial value for the name may be null until the API request is complete. After receiving a response, we'll update the variable to a string. In this scenario, we would get an error because TypeScript will not allow the data type to change. One solution would be to add the any type. The any type is a custom type by TypeScript. You can think of it as a get out of jail free card. We aren't restricted to a specific data type with this type. Unfortunately, we miss out on the benefits TypeScript brings to the table. There wouldn't be a point in using TypeScript. That doesn't mean you should never use the any type. It should be considered as a last resort option. That leads us to the question, what alternative solution is there? We can add union types. A union type is when multiple data types are given to a variable, excluding the any type. On our variable, 
instead of letting TypeScript infer the type, we can add the string data type back in. We can add more data types by separating them with a pipe character. After the pipe character, we will add the null data type. We can add as many data types as we'd like. After adding the data type, let's try changing the variable to null. As expected, TypeScript doesn't throw an error. If we want to use multiple data types, we must add the types to the variable. TypeScript will not infer union types. It's up to us to add them in. Otherwise, we may be restricted to one data type. One advantage of union types is being able to use them anywhere. We can add them to functions, return values, arrays, and objects. We're not limited to adding union types to variables. For example, let's switch over to the example.ts file. It's possible the shipping function may fail. We may want to return a boolean value for the developer to handle the error if it does. As of now, we're limited to returning numbers. If we want to return numbers and booleans, we'll need to add a union type. We'll update the function by adding the pipe character after the number return type. Next, we'll add the boolean type to the list of types. Just like that, we'll be able to return either a number or boolean from the function. Union types are powerful because of the flexibility they provide. Let's continue in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to learn how to annotate arrays and objects. Up until now, we've been focused on primitive types and functions. It's time to shift our focus to more complex types. The syntax for annotating arrays and objects is similar to annotating anything else in TypeScript. In our file, let's add a section for this demonstration. We will create an array called items with some string values. If we define an array with some values, TypeScript will infer the type of our array. According to our editor, TypeScript is inferring the array will store strings. That's great, but what if we want it to initialize an empty array? If our array were empty, type inference wouldn't work. By removing the items in the array, the type of the array has been set to any. In that case, we can explicitly annotate the array like we would any other variable. After the name of the variable, we'll add a colon followed by the type of values the array will store. Finally, we'll set the type to string. Despite setting the type, we'll get an error. The error will tell us the value is invalid. The problem is how we've annotated the variable. There's one extra bit of code we need to add. After the type, we'll add a pair of square brackets. By adding the square brackets, TypeScript will assume the array will be filled with strings. We can take this a step further by adding union types. If we need to store an array of different types of values, we can add a union type. We will add onto the annotation by including the number type. There's one important note I want to add. The square brackets are being added to both types. If we didn't include the square brackets to the number type, TypeScript would not allow us to store an array of numbers. Instead, it'll think the variable can hold an array of strings or a single number. Therefore, the square brackets must be applied to both types. One last thing, TypeScript can infer union types. For example, we can get the same union type if the array is filled with strings and numbers. So let's remove the annotation. Next. Let's add a number and string to the array. The array stores two types. If we hover our mouse over the variable, the editor will tell us we have a union type. That's very convenient. We don't have to worry about TypeScript accidentally adding the any type, which we should avoid. Let's move on to objects in the following lecture. In this lecture, we're going to look at how to apply types to an object. Working with objects in TypeScript is interesting. We can add optional properties, interfaces, and work with nested structures. 
Let's take it one step at a time. Below the array, we will add an object called Account. The Account object will represent a bank account. We'll keep it simple by adding two properties called Name and Balance. The Name property has a string value. The Balance property has a number value. We haven't annotated the object. Luckily, Type Inference kicks in since we're initializing the object with some values. If we hover our mouse over the object, TypeScript will correctly infer the types of our properties. It's also possible to explicitly define the types for an object. After the variable name, let's add a colon followed by a pair of square brackets. The syntax for annotating an object is similar to creating an object itself. The annotation should be an object with a list of properties that can be found within the object. If we decide to annotate properties in our object explicitly, we must set a type for every property. If there's a property inside our object that's not annotated, TypeScript will throw an error. Inside this object, we'll add the name and balance properties. They will be set to string and number, respectively. In some scenarios, you may want to make a property optional. For example, let's say we had a property called status. The type for this property will be set to string. After adding this type, an error is thrown by TypeScript. Taking a closer look at the error, it's telling us the status type is missing from the object. It's possible we may want to add this property at a later point in our application. We can get around this error without adding the property in our object by making it optional. In the annotation object, we will add a question mark symbol after the status property. We're adding the symbol to the annotation. It's not being applied to the value itself. It can be confusing with this syntax since the annotation and value are formatted the same. After adding the symbol, the error has disappeared. Great! Before I end this lecture, there's one more thing I want to mention. It's not uncommon to have to combine arrays and objects. For example, instead of a single account, we may need to work with multiple accounts. Below this variable, we will declare another variable called accounts. For the sake of simplicity, it won't have a value. We will annotate this variable by adding curly braces followed by a pair of square brackets. This syntax will tell TypeScript the variable will store an array of objects. That's all there is to it. In the next lecture, we will look at how we can clean this up by using interfaces. In this lecture, we're going to look at how we can use interfaces to make our objects more readable. The syntax for annotating an object kind of looks ugly and messy. I'm not a huge fan of it. We have two objects being annotated. Let's clean this up by using an interface. An interface is a TypeScript-specific feature for creating types for objects. It's an alternative syntax to what we're currently doing. Let's explore how an interface is created. Hopefully, once we've written an interface, it'll become clear why you may want to use them. Above the objects, we will type the interface keyword. The interface keyword allows us to create a custom type for an object. Instead of directly adding the types on the variable, we can extract the types to an interface. After typing the interface, we need to provide a name. While not required, most developers like to use Pascal casing for their interface names. In addition, some developers will add a capital I at the beginning of their name, which is short for interface. It helps other developers identify this as an interface. For this example, we will set the name to I account. Next, we can add the types for the object. We've already done so below. We will cut and paste the object annotation from the account variable. A couple of things worth mentioning. The interface cannot hold values. Interfaces are not a replacement for objects. 
They're a feature for helping us outsource the typing of an object. Another thing worth mentioning is that they don't get compiled into JavaScript. When we compile our code, the interface will be completely absent from our JavaScript file. Similar to how primitive types are removed from variables, interfaces get removed too. Let's make our interface more interesting. Objects can have methods. So, let's add a method. The method will be called deposit. It's completely acceptable to add methods, but there's one thing to keep in mind. We can't have business logic in our method. It's up to the object to implement the business logic. However, we can add the parameters and return type. For this example, we won't have parameters. The return type will be void. The void type is a special type for functions. Sometimes you may not want to return a value from your function. If that's the case, you can annotate a function with the void type, which means no return value. One last thing. We will make this method optional. Let's use our interface. We can apply the interface after the name of the variable. Instead of adding an object, we can pass in the name of the interface. We have another variable called accounts, which is basically an array of accounts. It would make sense to apply the interface here too. We will replace the object with the name of the interface. The square brackets can remain. This syntax will tell TypeScript we will have an array of accounts. By using an interface, our code looks so much cleaner. I recommend using interfaces whenever working with objects. In the next lecture, we'll look at an alternative syntax for creating objects. In this lecture, we're going to learn about classes. You should already have an idea of how classes work in JavaScript. Classes in TypeScript work the same way. However, there are some additional features worth mentioning. Let's go through them one by one. First, let's create a class. Below the objects, we will define a class called Investment Accounts. At the end of the day, classes are blueprints for objects. We can add interfaces to them. The syntax is slightly different. After the class name, we need to type the implements keyword. This keyword will tell TypeScript we're trying to add an interface to the class. We can follow this keyword with the name of the interface. We'll set the interface to iAccount. After adding the interface, our editor will throw an error at us. It's telling us we need to implement the properties and methods required by our interface. Let's try adding them in. There are two required properties, which are name and balance. It's optional to initialize the properties with values. We can leave them empty. As long as we're adding them to the class, TypeScript is happy. In addition, we can initialize these properties by adding them to the constructor function. In our class, we will add the constructor function. Inside the arguments of the constructor function, we will add both properties to this function. So far, so good. The last step is to add the public keyword to the parameters. The public keyword will allow our properties to be accessible outside of the class. If we add the public keyword to the constructor's parameters, it's the same as if they were initialized like above. We can remove this part of the code. This shorthand method of initializing variables is common in Angular. We'll be using this feature frequently. Speaking of public properties, we can make properties private. For example, let's add a method called withdraw. Let's say we don't want the withdraw method to be called outside the class. We can add the private modifier before the method name. By adding this keyword, the method can't be called outside the object. It must be called by another method from within the class. 
It's a great way of preventing yourself from accidentally calling the wrong method or preventing a library from calling it. If we don't make a property or method private, they're public by default. We don't have to add the public keyword to most properties and methods. The exception to this rule is the constructor function. If we were to omit this keyword from the parameters, they will not be initialized as properties to the class. Classes are heavily used in Angular. We'll get a lot of practice with them, as well as learn some features along the way. In the next lecture, we'll move on from classes to learn about generics. In this lecture, we're going to learn about generics. They are a feature frequently used in Angular. They allow functions or classes to be strict and flexible at the same time. Generics function similarly to parameters but with data types. Sounds confusing? Let's look at an example and the motivations behind generics. They're super simple once you see them in action. For this demonstration, let's work inside an empty file. We will create a new file called generics.ts. Inside this file, we will create a class called Q. In this scenario, let's pretend this class can handle a collection of items. It'll manage removing and pushing items into the class. That's already possible with array functions. However, you may want to replicate this behavior if you're interested in having refined control over how items get added or removed from an array. For this example, we will restrict the data type that can be added or removed from the array. First, we will create a property called data. It'll be a private property. Privatizing the array will prevent external code from interacting with the array. We are being very strict with our array. Next, we will define a method called add. This method will accept an argument called item. This argument will be pushed into the data array with the push function. Lastly, we will create a method called remove. The remove method will remove the first item in the array. Inside this method, we will call the shift function on the data array. The current implementation has a couple of problems. The biggest problem is how we're adding and removing values. At the moment, any value can be added or removed. Let's look at an example. Below this class, we will create a new instance of the class called NameQ. Our queue will hold an array of names. Let's try pushing two names by calling the add function. The first name will be a string. The second name will be a number. We're pushing in two different data types, which we may not want. We're not restricting the type of data that can be pushed into the object. One solution would be to add annotations to the parameters of the function. Let's try that. In the add functions parameters, we will set the type to string. By adding this annotation, TypeScript will throw an error. It's not letting us push a number, which is great. It helped us catch an error. Let's change this value to a string. So far, so good, right? Let's try creating a new queue. The new queue will be called number queue. Unlike the first queue, this queue will store numbers. Let's try adding a new number with the add function. We'll get an error. Even though we have a different queue, we can't use another type. Our queue is restricted to storing strings. We may want to restrict our array to a single data type, but the data type should be flexible from queue to queue. How do we get the best of both worlds? One solution would be to duplicate the class. One version for strings, another for numbers. Unfortunately, that's not scalable. If we want our class to be reusable, developers should be able to use it without modifying the original class. We can tackle this issue by using generics. A generic is a placeholder for data types. 
after the class name, we will add a pair of angle brackets. Inside these brackets, we will give the placeholder a name. We will use the letter T. Next, we will update the add function by setting the parameters data type to T. Afterward, we will annotate the data property to be an array of the T type. Lastly, we will add angle brackets to both new instances. They must be placed before the parentheses. The first instance will have string. The second instance will have a number. Let me break down what's going on. The generic is the letter T in the angle brackets. It's a placeholder for the data type. The letter T can represent any data type. This can be strings, numbers, booleans, or custom types. By defining this generic, we can use it anywhere in our class. In this case, we're adding it to the item parameter in the add function. If this generic is set to string, the item parameter will be restricted to strings. If it represents the number type, the item parameter will be restricted to numbers, so on and so forth. We can configure the data type when we create a new instance, which we're doing in the code below. For example, the first instance is setting the type to string. Therefore, only strings can be pushed into the array. We can prove this by removing the quotes from one of the values in the add function. An error gets thrown by the compiler. It's telling us the type must be string. Despite the string data type not being present in the class, TypeScript can intelligently restrict the values to strings. In the second instance, the array is restricted to numbers. By using generics, we can have type safety while allowing our class to be flexible for any type. You may be wondering, why the letter T? Truthfully, we can use any name we'd like. For example, we can swap this name with the word baseball. This class will still work. However, it's common practice to use the letter T, which is short for type. It's not required, but standard among developers. In most documentation and examples, you will find developers like to use the letter T. At the end of the day, it's up to you to decide if you want to follow this naming convention. Generics can be applied to functions and class methods. They're not exclusive to classes. The first example shows how the T generic can be used for our parameters and return type. The same goes for the class method. Throughout this course, generics will pop up. It's not common to create them, but it's always good to know how they work under the hood. In a similar sense, decorators are another feature we'll be using but won't be writing. It is still good to know how they work though. We'll learn about decorators in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to discuss an experimental feature called decorators. Every feature of TypeScript we've explored so far has been related to type safety. TypeScript does an extremely good job of helping us verify the types of our data. Type safety is the main selling point of TypeScript. There's another side of TypeScript we haven't had a chance to explore. It allows us to write next generation JavaScript. JavaScript is constantly evolving. There's an official committee responsible for deciding what features get added to the language. This committee is called TC39. Their discussions are open to the public. We're able to view what they're working on. Typically, features go through a process. The first stage in the process is called straw person. During this part of the process, members of the committee may propose a new idea. If members like the idea, they'll move on to the next stage. Next, one of the members will begin drafting a document of the proposal. This document will include an extensive description of how the feature will work in the JavaScript language. At this point, members will discuss if there are problems with this proposal. The draft will be revised dozens of times throughout this process. In the next stage, members will begin writing the syntax rules for the feature. The team works with another team called Babel to make this feature a reality. Babel is a library for writing next-generation JavaScript in our applications. 
developers can test new features before they become available in browsers. After feedback has been implemented, the next stage is where members discuss any last issues with the proposal. If there aren't, the feature is moved on to the last stage, which is to make the feature an official part of the language. In the Resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to the official list of TC39 proposals. As you can see, the list is almost endless. The feature we're interested in is called Decorators. As of this video, you should be able to find it under Stage 2. Decorators are an upcoming feature in JavaScript. It's a feature heavily used in Angular. If we want to learn Angular, learning Decorators is a must. We have two options for working with Decorators. We can use Babel, which would require additional setup. Luckily, TypeScript supports Decorators. One of the extra benefits of using TypeScript is being able to access newer features in JavaScript. So, what are decorators? Why does Angular use them? Decorators are functions for extending business logic or adding metadata. Sounds cool, but doesn't really explain what decorators are. Let me give you an analogy. Let's imagine we had a Christmas tree. By themselves, Christmas trees are plain and boring. That's why we add decorations to them. Decorations can liven up a tree. It doesn't matter how many decorations you've added to the tree, it's still considered a tree. In a similar sense, decorators work the same way. They allow us to modify an existing piece of code. After the decorator has made its modifications, we're returned the same piece of code, but with the modifications. Let's look at an example of what problems decorators solve. We have two classes with the same property. Imagine if we had two classes with dozens of similar properties and methods. We should avoid repeating the same code whenever possible. This problem is as old as time. Avoiding duplicate code is an issue developers face. Throughout the years, developers have come up with solutions for fixing this issue. We can use high-order components, composable functions, and closures. You may be familiar with these solutions if you worked with React or Vue. Each of these solutions works, but there are some drawbacks to each of them. Decorators resolve a lot of the issues with these other patterns. One of the advantages of decorators is that we can apply them to classes, properties, methods, accessors, and parameters. Thus, they can reach certain areas in our code where other patterns can't. Alright, enough talk. Let's start writing some code. We'll get started in the following lecture. In this lecture, we're going to configure TypeScript. Decorators are an experimental feature. If we want to use decorators, we need to configure TypeScript to enable them. We can configure TypeScript by creating a configuration file. This file can be created manually. Alternatively, the TypeScript package adds a command for creating a basic configuration file. Let's give the package a try. In the command line, run the following command, npx tsc init. After running this command, TypeScript will have created a file called tsconfig.json. Let's open this file. Out of the box, TypeScript will recommend dozens of settings for configuring the library. Luckily, we won't have to configure them all. The default settings will work for most situations. When we switch to Angular, it'll configure this file for us. It's not essential to learn every option. Inside the Compiler Options object, we're going to remove every option. They're not necessary for what we're trying to do. The option we care about is called Experimental Decorators. Let's add this option to the Compiler Options object. Its value will be true. By setting this option to true, we'll be able to write decorators in our files. That's it! We've enabled decorators. If you're interested in learning the other options, check out the link in the resource section of this lecture. This page will document every option in detail. As you can see, TypeScript is very flexible. In the next lecture, we're going to begin writing decorators. I'll see you there.
In this lecture, we're finally going to write a decorator. For this demonstration, we will be working on a new file. In your project, create a file called decorator.ts. Let's say we were creating a restaurant's application. We will need to create a menu. Each item on the menu will have a class. For our first menu item, we will create a class called Pizza. We will create another menu item with a class called Hamburger. Both classes will have a property called ID with the string type. Great! We've got a couple of classes for our menu, but neither have an ID. We should assign an ID to them. We can add IDs to them in the class, but let's use decorators to set the IDs. A decorator is written as a function. Above the two classes, we will create a function called menu item. The name of our decorator is Pascal Cased. It's not necessary to write the names of decorators in Pascal Case, but it is standard practice. This function will have one parameter called target with the function type. The type of the target parameter is set to function because classes are functions for creating objects. They're syntactic sugar. Therefore, we can set the type of the target parameter to function. The function we've created will accept a class, which makes it a decorator. The next step is to apply this decorator to the class. Decorators can be applied by adding the at symbol followed by the name of the decorator. We will apply the menu item decorator to the pizza class. Decorators sit on top of the class they're applied to. Just like that, we've created our first decorator. It doesn't do much, so let's modify the ID. In our function, we're going to set the ID property through the target.prototype object to ABC. By adding properties to the target object, they'll be applied to our classes. Let's test if this is true. At the bottom of our classes, let's log the ID of the pizza class after creating a new instance. Next. Let's compile our script with the npxtsc command. We aren't going to provide a file name to the command. If we don't provide a file name, TypeScript will compile every file we have in our directory. Everything should work after compiling the script. Let's test our script by running the node-decorator command. The ID has been set to abc. Our decorator modified this property. As you can see, decorators are very powerful. They allow us to modify and add properties to a class. We can take this a step further by passing in values to our decorators. At the end of the day, decorators are just functions. Like any other function, we pass in values to configure the behavior of the decorator. Back at the top of the file, we're going to modify our function. We need to use a closure for accepting properties. Let me show you what I mean. The menu item function will return the function for modifying the target. The outer function will be responsible for accepting values, whereas the inner function will be responsible for interacting with the target. In our outer function's parameters, we can accept incoming data. We will have one parameter called item ID with the string type. Next, in the inner function, we will set the ID property to the item ID argument. After modifying our decorator, we will get an error from TypeScript. It'll tell us we are calling the menu item decorator incorrectly. We need to call it like a function. Inside the parentheses, we can pass in whatever value we'd like. In the case of our menu item decorator, we need to pass in a string that'll act as an ID. Let's pass in ABC. Interestingly, decorators are reusable. Let's apply the same decorator to the hamburger class. Give it any ID you'd like. 
With the help of decorators, both classes have their IDs set by the decorator. We have a simple example, but imagine if we wanted to add dozens of methods and properties to multiple classes. By using a decorator, extending a class is easy. Hopefully, it's becoming clear as to why you may want to use decorators. They allow us to extend a class with properties and methods. Another benefit of decorators is being able to apply them directly to properties, methods, and accessors. We don't have to apply them to the overall class. The syntax is different based on the target. For that reason, we won't be diving into how to create decorators for different targets. The main point of this lecture is to understand how decorators work. They're heavily used in Angular. It's unlikely we will be writing decorator functions. Instead, we will be using decorators defined by Angular. The decorators from the Angular framework will cover most of our needs. As long as you understand what decorators do, you should be good to go. This is the last lecture on TypeScript. There are so many features in TypeScript we haven't got to cover. However, these features will be enough to get you through the Angular course. As we progress through the course, we will cover additional features. I can't wait to get started with Angular. I'll see you in the next section.